Okay, I'm going to go ahead and call this meeting to order. This meeting is being held in the council chambers, which are open for public attendance and participation. The meeting will also be live streamed for public viewing, but not participation. At the link identified in the agenda, emailed comments sent and received by the city clerk at least 24 hours before the meeting were distributed to the city council prior to the meeting. Before I make, uh, before I do the roll call, I would like to point out that uh, the vice mayor is traveling this evening, and council member Shaw had a family emergency he had to attend to. Can I have roll call, please? Mayor Kirchner. Present. Vice Mayor Harris. Council member Boomgarden. Here. Council member Pasquale. Here. Council member Shaw. Thank you. For the invocation uh, this evening, we have uh, Elder uh, Ken Cunningham from Cornerstone Church from Yuba City. And uh, we will, we will uh, stand for that and will remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance will be provided by Council Member Boomgarten. So let us pray. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the dedication and courage of these public servants gathered tonight to conduct the business of this city. Bless them, for they have a desire to help our community where there is great need and potential, but resources are limited. May they find unity in their purpose for service as well as in their response to the challenges we face in Yuba City. May their deliberations be characterized with honesty and charity towards one another. May you give them the wisdom and insight they need to govern judiciously. May you empower them in their discussion and in the decisions they make tonight. Help them to act with clarity and conviction for what is good and right. Through their God-given authority, may their governance serve the common good and promote the well-being and flourishing of our community Bless them and our city, we humbly ask, in the name of Jesus, the wellspring of every good and perfect gift from whom all blessings flow. Amen. Amen. Please tell me the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. So for our ceremonial presentations, it looks like we're going to have to move number one to possibly the next city council meeting because uh, Marty Sanders is not in attendance this evening. Uh, moving on to uh, public communication, number two, appearance of interested citizens. You are welcome and encouraged to participate in this meeting. Public comment is taken on action items appearing on the consent calendar or business items on the agenda when they are called. Public comment on any other item within the scope of the city's jurisdiction, including items not listed on the agenda, will be considered at this time. Public comment is limited to three minutes per speaker. Members of the public submitted written requests at least 24 hours prior to the meeting will be allotted five minutes to to comment per speaker. R repetitive comments may be limited and large groups are encouraged to select rep representatives to express their, the opinions of the group. Do we have, we do have a speaker card um, from Cash Gill. Well, that was on the item. Oh, I'm sorry, that's on item number 12. Okay, so back on the um, public comment, do we have any uh, comments from the public at this point, at this time? Any public comments? Okay, seeing none. Uh, consent calendar. All matters listed under consent calendar are considered to be routine and can be uh, can be enacted in one motion. There will be no separate discussion on these items prior to that time. Council votes on the motion on the motion unless members of the city council request specific items to be discussed or removed from the consent calendar for individual actions. Do we have any comments from the public on consent calendar items three through nine? Any public comments? Three through nine. Okay. Mr. Mayor? Yes. 
do think there was some discussion back here about item six. Did you want some clarification on that, ma'am? We can pull it and talk about it. Okay. Right Let's pull that one and we can discuss it. Okay. So we're pulling uh, consent calendar uh, number six from consent, moving it to business. Any other comments from the uh, public on consent items three through nine? Any other for, for the comments? Okay. Bring it to uh, council for action. So I've got a motion from Council Member Pasquale. Second. And a second from Council Member Boomgarden. All those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, all of those opposed say nay. Ayes have it. Okay. So we're going to move uh, number six to the first item on the business. On the business. Okay, so uh, it looks like transfer of city property, harder marketplace. Yeah, so I don't have a, um, a visual for everybody, but it, <clears throat> really what it is, is this is a, um, a procedural requirement for the frontage road um, at the northwest corner of Harder Parkway and Highway 20. So there's, old, there's an abandoned um, road frontage. So when you first turn off the highway going northbound on Harder Parkway, if you look to the left, there's um, an old road right away right there um, that's on the left that used to be the frontage road that would connect to the west. And so... As part of the harder specific plan and the development that's pending, so there's three, there's three, um, two subdivision maps and a tentative parcel map there for the west side of Harder Parkway. And so there's, there's development that's taking place with the Harder Marketplace that uh, the staff has received a use permit to move forward with that parcel map, and then also with the subdivision, Dr. Horton's moving forward with the subdivision. And so, um, as part of the harder specific plan and the ultimate layout for that area. That, that old road front right away along the fence there, northwest corner of Highway 20 and um, Harder Parkway is being, we're, we're authorizing um, the public works director to sign the, the necessary documents to transfer that property in, in, in to participate with the, um, with the map. And so what we wanna do is we wanna combine that area into the parcel map so then it combines with the, the um, the ultimate layout, and then with the recording of the final map, then they will dedicate the new road that will then come north and up and around and come out where the existing signal's at. So um, hopefully that explained it and where we could be followed, but um, let me know. I'd be happy to answer any questions about it. Any uh, further questions from the council? Okay. Um, any uh, action from the council? Mr. Mr. Mayor, if I... Yes, I'm sorry. I'm yes. sorry. Before we finish the uh, motion, could we uh, send this matter out to the public for comment? Okay. Thank you. Any uh, further public comment on uh, consent calendar item number six? Oh. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Sharon Foote, and I reside on Thomas Drive in Yuba City. Um, on number six, I'm still trying to figure out <laughs> exactly what property you're giving away. Um, when I was on the uh, Parks Commission, we had looked at part of that parcel there for a park. And at the time, the farm owner uh, did not want to sell it to us at a reasonable price. Matter of fact, he really didn't want to sell it because he planned to develop the property into housing. Um, so I'm still trying to figure out where I'm thinking and where exactly is you're giving this property away. And I th so I think um, we're going to pull it up on a map. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. We're, we're trying to pull. So we're we're going we're gonna to pull that up on a map right now. So uh, it, maybe it's a little bit uh, clearer. Brad was on the was our uh, designated leader when I was on the Parks Commission. So, so if we follow this area, this is um, Highway 20, uh, east, right. and, east and west, Harder Parkway to the north, 
And so this is the old road right of way um, that we're talking about. Is part that of where the street swirls around and comes around to go to the housing so, that's in that area? So just to the east of that. So the street right now comes along and then, then turns north hard right here. And so this is the old where, where it's abandoned right now. Why wouldn't you keep some of that for the current um, park that you're putting in there on down further? So ultimately, we want a, a, a road width that goes north, that meets city standards, that, that comes to the north, and it comes out it to the designated area. And the, par the park is farther north. I realize the park is down further, but when we were talking about it on the commission, we were talking about that particular parcel as uh, one that we would like to have in a park. But I gathered that's changed, obviously. But... Uh, yeah, I, I really bad, think th I this think is really road the frontage. The would be a good addition to the park. <clears throat> and I just don't like that. They're just giving this parcel to someone who wants to do some development. Sell it to him? Giving it to him? I question that. Thank you. Thank you. So, so I would just add to make sure that the easements are kept for the, for the public utility easements. And then the road, it's transferred with the dedications. It's, and, and it's part of the development agreement with the property okay. where, where there was credits taken into effect. Any further public comment on consent counter item number six? Any further comments? Uh, any comments, questions from the council on consent item number six? No, sir. Okay, I'll bring it back to the council for action. Item number six on the consent calendar, transfer of city property to Harder Marketplace. Adopt a resolution declaring the property described under resolution number 05-086 as being exempt under the Surplus Land Act and authorizing the public works director to execute all documents necessary to transfer real property interest in said property to the owner of the adjacent parcel to the north, APN 62-310-016. No address or AP is available consistent of the former North Calusa frontage road between the proposed Harder Marketplace Way and Harder Parkway. Second. So I've got a motion, a first and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Moving to business item number 10, <laughs> DWR 2022 Urban Community Drought Relief Grant Program. Presented by Kathy Willis. Good evening. Good evening. Um, good evening, Mayor and, and Council Members. I'm here to present, uh, this is Kathy Willis, Environmental Compliance Manager, and I'm here to present um, our uh, community, drought, community Drought Relief Grant Program um, application. So as background, um, ongoing drought conditions have required um, water suppliers to intensify conservation efforts. The state is now focused on reducing outdoor water use by commercial, industrial, and institutional customers. And future red legislation is likely to require um, these, cu these customers to convert non-functional turf, um, so grass that's not used for um, uh, recreation and that sort of thing to low water use uses. But the Department of Water Resources has created grant programs for local agencies for water conservation efforts. So the, the current year water outlook, um, the drought status remains um, while weather effects and snowpack levels are analyzed. Staff continues to monitor water supply and we're waiting for the state's determination. Staff will return to the council in April with a full water outlook update. Under this grant, there are three projects. Um, the first is city owned property turf replacement. And this gives us a chance to set the example for water efficient landscaping for non-functional turf conversion. The second category is um, 
um, commercial and industrial turf replacement. And this will help to mitigate the financial burden to businesses for turf conversions. And the third category is every drop counts rebate and education program expansion. And this allows us to expand our current water conservation, education, and outreach uh, rebate programs. So we have six city properties that are identified for um, replacement of the non-functional turf. The turf will be replaced with low and moderate water use plants. Uh, and walkways will be of decomposed granite or other permeable materials. We anticipate substantial water savings and ball fields, play areas, and grass used for recreational activities will not be converted. So the six city sites that we've identified um, are City Hall, the water treatment plant, the wastewater treatment plant, Holly Tree Park, Kingwood Park, and Shanghai Garden Park. So we've done this kind of work at Goshi uh, Aquatic uh, park, and you can see it does not give you a desert, um, and and uh, we will. Um, it'll anyway. <laughs> so on the uh, turf replacement program, you can have a rebate. We'll have rebates of up to five dollars per square foot of, of turf converted, and it will be awarded on a first come, first serve basis. In the every dro every drop counts program expansion. Um, we'll expand our water conservation education, outreach, and rebate programs. And our expanded offerings may include new rebate offers, multimedia education materials, and in-person outreach. The grant proposal itself, it's a $3.1 million um, proposal. $2.5 million will be city-owned property turf replacement projects. 500,000 will be the commercial property turf re replacement rebate program. And $100,000 will be the every, every drop counts rebate and education program expansion. Um, we've applied as a, as a disadvantaged community to eliminate the 25% local match. And if we do not receive that, if we don't qualify for that match, then we will not move forward with this project. We're recommending that the council adopt a resolution authorizing the public works director to, um, to accept and execute all the documents associated with, with these grant applications. And A, B, and C are each the, the individual projects that I just mentioned. Um, and do, I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, do we have any comments from the public on this item? Any comments from the public? Well, thank you for that very thorough presentation. Do we have any uh, comments or questions from the council? <coughs> Councilman, uh, please go ahead. I saw that you have Kingwood Park on there. Uh, I grew up in that neighborhood, and I know that a lot of little leaguers, soccer players, and the such, are you going to eliminate all of the grass at Kingwood Park? No, any grass that's used for those kinds of um, programs, recreational activities. Just be doing it around the edges or whatever. Right. Okay. All right. That answers my question. Okay. Any questions? Let's, no questions. Comments through the mayor. Um, appreciate staffs looking into this grant. Um, is this competitive? Um, it sounds like it is. Yes. How do you think we're placed? Well, <laughs> we. Um, this is the same program through which we got the uh, ASR funding last year. So for that reason alone, I mean, if they're trying to spread the money further, the state, then we've, we've had a crack at it. But uh, otherwise, I think it's, I mean, in my opinion, it's a good project and it it's, should be competitive. Excellent. Thank you. No questions. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, thorough presentation. I'm glad that we're leading by example on this in California. <laughs> nowadays, uh, water seems to be very... Uh, unpredictable. So thank you for doing this. So bring this to council for uh, any action. Um, through the mayor. Yes. I'd like to move forward with an adopt with a motion to approve items A, B, and C as provided uh, in the staff report. I've got a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Um, got a motion uh, and, and a second. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed aye. say nay. The ayes have it. Thank you very much.
Moving along to uh, agenda item number 11, abandoned rail, railroad corridor feasibility study adoption. And this will be presented by John, excuse me, jo Josh Wolf. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Um, I'm here tonight to present to you the Abandoned Railroad Corridor Feasibility Study Adoption. I'm actually very excited for this project. Um, I'm here tonight with Eric Espinoza, uh, Senior Engineer from Dawkin Engineering and uh, the Project Manager for this project as well. So uh, to give a little bit of background, um, the Abandoned Railroad Corridor um, that goes through town starts in the, sit in the town of Sutter and then um, moves easterly um, over to about Jefferson Avenue, or sorry, Hooper Road, and then we're currently working on a project to extend that project, or extend the bike path to DRS Baines Park and then Hart Parkway. So the purpose of this study was to look at the abandoned railroad corridor portions that have not been built out yet and are not owned by the city. That's from Harder Parkway here, going diagonally southeast through the city down to Clark Avenue, where it kind of levels out and then connects to um, Pluma Street. So a little bit of background on this project. In 2019, the city applied for a Caltrans uh, Sustainable Transportation Planning Sustainable Communities Grant to secure funding for the feasibility study for this project. In June of 2020, the city was notified that it was awarded $200,000 for the study. Then in November of 2020, um, the city entered into an agreement with Caltrans to secure the funding. In September of 2021, the city issued an RFP for the study development. And then in December of 2021, the city awarded, our city council awarded a professional services agreement to Dock and Engineering of Folsom, California for the study. So throughout uh, 2022, Dock and performed outreach. They had audited the abandoned railroad corridors right of way, its physical conditions, um, its environmental conditions to see if a project was feasible and if so, what alternatives would be the most feasible alternatives for the project. Through that process, Dawkins determined that yes, the project is feasible and there are two major alternatives. Alternative one would be a um, 18 foot wide path with 12 feet of the path being an asphalt concrete or AC path for bicyclists. And then a six foot wide sidewalk or a concrete sidewalk for pedestrians. Um, this alternative was chosen uh, with a lot of input from the public, um, just expressing a lot of conflicts between bicycle riders, pedestrians on the current path that's only eight foot wide. One reason they want that we decided that this option was the more feasible alternative was having a concrete path is a clear delineation in color. So it's easy to tell pedestrians over here, cyclists over here. Also it's lower maintenance um, over time compared to asphalt. Um, and then down below, we just have the alternative two, which is an 18 foot wide AC path. So there are a uh, few large components to this ultimate project uh, for the city. Um, one of the larger components of this project is an overcrossing that would be necessary at Stabler Lane and State Route 99 crossing. Um, you could see here is the first crossing at Stabler Lane. Here's another crossing at 99. And then in between we have um, some uh, raised concrete here, uh, or raised concrete bridge all the way through and carrying you over. Eric will get into a little bit more of the details on this later in the presentation. Second major crossing um, was at State Route 99. Um, right here, you have West Onstott Road, the Best Western, Northside Fitness over here, and then some of the um, dealerships over here. One thing I'd like to point out about this area in particular was uh, Dawkins was cognizant of future development um, through the city while doing the study. Part of that being the future Civic Center Boulevard extension, um, where you have Civic Center Boulevard extending where it currently ends at um, 
U-Haul and the 76 station coming down southeast and then extending and connecting into West Onsot Boulevard. So that was considered, and um, the alignment was made such that it has minimal right-of-way needed outside of the railroad corridor to cross here. Um, some of the other important things uh, through the study were safety components for the trail. I have a few different examples of that here. On the top left, you have what are called bulbouts. This is just an aerial view example from uh, the city of Sacramento. The bulbouts allow the um, pedestrian crossings to become closer and also act as somewhat of a bottleneck to drivers and a traffic calming measure to slow vehicles down. Um, another one that's going to be big on large um, or high volume, high traffic intersections are what are called high intensity activated um, beacons or hawk signals. They're more or less traffic signals except for pedestrian crossings. So at high stress locations like um, Clark Avenue, Gray Avenue, th these work pretty well to make drivers aware of pedestrians crossing. Other components that may be included would be rectangular rapid flashing beacons. We have these at various locations in town, such as um, Franklin Ave or Franklin Road um, in between Harding and um, North Walton Avenue. Um, pedestrian <laughs> refuge islands, allowing pedestrians to um, safely cross and stop if need be in the middle of the intersection. Um, lastly, one of the biggest things is we want to make this trail not only connect throughout the city, but also connect into Marysville at some point. So once the railroad corridor terminates at Pluma Street, uh, Dawkin analyzed eight different alternatives for connecting the end of the bike path to the Feather River Levee Trail and then ultimately to the Fifth Street Bridge. Through that, the preferred alternative from community input um, analysis of um, stress levels for riders and um, cost came down to uh, Plumas. Once you enter Plumas Street going south until you hit B Street and then um, riding B Street to the Feather River Levee Trail near the old courthouse. Um, this alternative was low cost, really easy to retrofit to make the uh, riders and pedestrians safe and comfortable while riding through town. Um, another item that will come up later in design are potential trail amenities. We got a lot of great input from the public on this. Some potential items that could be included in the construction would be periodic benches along the trail so that people can um, sit and relax after walking a while, um, trash enclosures to ensure that the trail is clean, low maintenance um, landscaping, uh, bike fix-it stations would be nice um, in case you run into a flat tire or any issues. This is actually a picture from uh, DDRS Baines Park, one of the models we're using there. Uh, fitness nodes for doing workout circuits along the trail shade trees um, that are low maintenance and uh, low water, um, solar lighting, and then uh, water, uh, water fountains along the trail at, at uh, certain points. So for the fiscal impact, the city was awarded $200,000 uh, for the uh, feasibility study. Um, the city was required to pay $25,912 for a local match. Staff is, now that the study is complete, staff is working to close out the project with Caltrans and seek final reimbursement. Um, after closeout, there will be no direct costs associated any further and no costs associated with adopting the study. So, through the study, we determined that the total project cost from start to finish will be $70 million. Um, preliminary, so we broke it into five different phases, preliminary engineering being uh, about $7,032,000, right-of-way and acquisition being about $7,766,400, environmental and remediation being about $8,055,000, 
construction being the largest portion at $50,218,500, and then construction support being $7,553,300. Um, just for note, the environmental and remediation right away and acquisition costs, um, there is to be further environmental analysis done on certain portions of the project. So that could affect um, cost for remediation and for acquisition. Um, but luckily, right now, there's a lot of funding available for active transportation and trails types projects. I've just highlighted four major programs that we will likely leverage this feasibility study to um, apply for projects if uh, we do adopt this study, one of which being Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality Grant, CMAC. We actually use that on the Franklin Avenue project in 2020. The Active Transportation Program, which we're currently using on the Sutter Bike Path Gap Closure Project. Regional Trails Program through the State Department of Parks and Recreation. And then the Surface Transportation Block Grant Program. All funding sources that we can apply to this project. Um, so that is kind of the overview of this project and it, to get into a little bit more detail on how we conducted the feasibility study, I'm gonna hand this off to Eric Espinosa. Thank you, Josh. And good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Um, <clears throat> as Josh said, um, I'll go a little bit more into some of the details, but Josh did a great job on summarizing the uh, overall uh, scope and uh, the findings as well as the uh, conclusion on our, our estimate. Um, <clears throat> I'll start off with some of the design considerations that uh, uh, we're taking the team considered. Um, one of them being the existing corridor width. Currently, UPRR owns 80 feet uh, wide corridor, and let's see, there's a pointer, yep. Uh, corridor from fence to fence. Uh, so this particular example here is a picture taking a Tharp Road and facing east, and you can see the um, that the corridor has no longer any any railroads, but uh, it's the, there's several overhead utilities and um, and some trees already. But overall, a clear path for um, providing that that width on the alternative one, which is that 12 foot plus 6 foot uh, pedestrian sidewalk. Um, so it's an 18 foot path uh, fitting within the existing uh, UPR right away. Um, a, another um, design consideration is uh, connections to adjacent facilities. Um, so not only to connections to streets, uh, existing sidewalks, but also to other amenities along the city, such as the uh, skate park, and uh, as well as uh, some, oops, as well as a connection to some of the businesses that have access uh, to their. Um, so there are outdoor seating or outdoor lunch areas where uh, the bike path can lead to. Um, so those were connections that were accounted for for creating a, an alignment and connections to existing adjacent facilities. Um, at the three uh, intersections that uh, Josh mentioned, which are Stabler Lane, uh, Highway 20, and Highway 99, uh, great separated crossings were um, accounted for, looked into to provide a separated crossing from uh, for pedestrians so they don't need to cross the multi-lane um, high volume traffic roads. So at those particular uh, three intersections, uh, overcrossings and undercrossings were looked into. Um, here we have a couple examples of what uh, potential overcrossings can look like um, with uh, two span uh, structures or a single span structure depending on the on the the span of the um, of the crossing um, there's several benefits so these overcrossings um, obviously they're the safety component given that there's less uh, conflict or crossings for pedestrians and bicyclists at the intersections uh, but then um, the, uh, the alignments that we looked into uh, considered that uh, right away, adjacent right away, and keeping the, the alignment as best as possible within the, uh, the available space, as well as uh, meeting uh, necessary clearances under these structures for traffic, as well as um, uh, sight distance for bicyclists and pedestrians as they're um, up, going up on the, um, on the vertical profile of the alignment. Um, 
So those are some of the overcrossing examples. Um, there's also undercrossings, and in this particular alignment or design, the um, the the I guess the um, pedestrians and bicyclists would travel under under the light traffic and through over these structures. Um, but as you can see, it, some of the um, downsides to these structures are they become long, long tunnels depending on the length and dark spaces as well as depressed areas that collect runoff and become could become um, um, flooded. So to mitigate for that, there's additional cost for drainage um, facilities, drainage pumps to uh, clear the, uh, the flooding from these, these structures. So um, Other considerations include uh, real estate and um, utility impacts. So we looked into a design that would avoid as much, as many impacts as possible. Um, so for instance, in this picture, uh, we got a, this is off of Highway 20 here, and uh, there's a, um, oops, there is a um, billboard that uh, could potentially be impacted, as well as some overhead utilities that uh, would um, ultimately be uh, could not be avoided to fit the under the overcrossings. Um, but the the cost for these um, impacts were included in the right of way cost in the estimate. Um, so all these all these uh, preliminary. Um, considerations were included in our estimates and presented to the public in the initial um, information preliminary design that we presented and um, and the additional uh, feedback received from the public was also taken in consideration to um, to grade the different alternatives the overcrossings the undercrossings and the different connections to and amenities to um, adjacent parcels or adjacent uh, streets uh, some of the throughout the year, the team prepared us uh, or presented at several uh, public events. Uh, for instance, at uh, here back in in May last year, the team presented at the uh, farmers market, where it was uh, the first chance that the public got to see uh, some of the preliminary design and uh, initial ideas. And I got to say that it was pleasant to see all the the positive feedback and excitement from the public to hear that this was actually happening. So there was a lot of a great impact, great uh, positive feedback and uh, support from the public and people willing to provide their opinions and their uh, of, um, preferences or feedback of what they would like to see on the path that we were able to include on the uh, estimates and um, the preliminary design so that uh, it's accounted for and, and the people get something that they, they're looking forward to, to using. So at the, um, at the, during the summer, we were able to attend the Sutter County Fair and uh, present some of the, um, the initial feedback that we received and up, update some of the design, the preliminary design, as well as okay. provide additional information sure. to the public. Yes. Um, we're stopping this? Yes. OK. Man, we're dropping off like flies. OK. <laughs> So through the mayor, my yes. recommendation is now that we have the recusal that he just noticed when the when the picture came up there, um, thank you very much, Councilmember Boomgarden, for moving so quickly on that. We, we no longer have a quorum for this particular item. Uh -huh. So my suggestion is as we continue it to the next meeting so that we can have a different mix. Um, I apologize to the consultant at the last minute change right. and for any members of the public who may have come here to speak on this item. But because we no longer have a quorum because we have a recusal for transparency, this will be moved to the next meeting. Sorry about this, gentlemen. So it looks like we're going to move this to the next uh, council meeting. No worries. So thank you for your time. Of course. If I could get Ben up there for a second. Ben, do we have a deadline that we need to adopt this by? Yeah, I'm just, um, I'm concerned if we could pause and maybe talk um, with council a little bit more about this. There is a funding deadline requirement that it needs to be adopted by March 1st to meet our funding requirement. And so the, um, you know, I just want to, this is again, this is a feasibility study that affects the city citywide. And so I don't know if, if there's any opportunity that that's in consideration on how it affects the parcel. Thank, thank you, Ben. There is an exception called the public generally, and that is if a project generally affects the public for, you know, like you're replacing sewers throughout the city, for example, that affects just about everybody and your council members can participate in that. My understanding from this particular item, however, is we were doing a feasibility study along a certain corridor. Is that correct? 
That is correct. So we, we are analyzing it across the city, citywide. It's, um, it's, it begins on the west edge of the city limits and, and continues to the, to the east boundary. Um, um, it does go along a, a subject property, um, but it is a, is a citywide impact. Do you believe that that corridor affects, and I'm trying to find a way is what I'm doing here, folks, is why we're having this conversation. Do you believe that that corridor affects more than like, say, 10% of the city? Absolutely. Properties? Does it affect more than 10% of the properties within the city, would you say, within 500 to 1,000 feet of it? It doesn't touch 10% of the, the properties, no, but, uh, but it is really truly a regional path for the city. You know, th this is the problem. I'm so sorry. This is the problem we have with conflicts that come at the last minute. There's so many, they're so factually intense and there's so many exceptions to them. Um, my suggestion is, is if we have a time limit, the safer practice is to keep the recusal for tonight and set a special meeting right. if you have to the city council and get this item done so that you can right. meet your March 1st deadline. Yeah, we'll work with uh, the state and, and see what we can do with the recusal. Can we fit that uh, in with the, uh, the city to do a special meeting for that? Uh, city manager. Yeah, we'll coordinate uh, council's calendars to okay. figure out when we can do a special meeting. Okay. okay. All right. So just to be clear, this and, and we'll check first. I, I don't want to have a special meeting. If we could postpone it, you know, we'll work with the state funding and see if we could um, push it till the first meeting in March. Okay. All righty. And just one more item again. Thank you to everyone who's your flexibility. We want to make sure we're completely transparent in these sorts of things. And so, I've, if that's okay, Mayor, we will move to the next item. Yes, we're going to go ahead and move this uh, agenda item uh, 11 to um, the next uh, city council meeting. Thank you, gentlemen, for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, moving along to uh, agenda item 12, professional service uh, services agreement with Smart Marketing and Public Affairs for Revenue Measure Consulting Services. This is presented by Diana Langley, our city manager. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, so before I start this item tonight, I just wanna note that um, we're at the very, very early stages of evaluating a revenue measure and so um, as I go through this presentation, just keep that in mind that we're at the early stages. So beginning in 2019, um, the city council um, has participated in a budget ad hoc group to evaluate the city's budget. So for the last four years, council has designated a budget ad hoc committee that's been comprised of two council members. And at budget time, which we get into about now, and then we meet with the budget ad hoc in April, uh, those two council members review the department requests for the operating budget, the capital acquisitions, personnel requests, the capital improvement program. In addition, they review um, projected expenditures and revenues for the current year budget. And through that process, they have gone through the budget to try to streamline the budget and then also uh, make sure that we are budgeting uh, according to need and then also that in the correct accounts. On December 20th, 2022, uh, City Council designated a revenue ad hoc comprised of Vice Mayor Harris and Council Member Boomgarden to, to evaluate a potential um, revenue measure for the city as well as evaluate other opportunities to increase revenues within the city. So during the month of January, uh, staff met with Council Member Boomgarden and Vice Mayor Harris, and we reviewed the city's five-year fiscal outlook the road plan that uh, looked at the city's um, current condition of the roadways, which you don't have to look at a plan to look at that. You can just drive around and see how terrible the roadways are. We also heard about um, priorities from Chief Alexander and Chief Baker, and then also discussed form as forming a citizen ad hoc because the revenue ad hoc committee really wants uh, the feedback and participation from the citizens. And so, 
it's at that point in time that we said, okay, if we're going to move forward with these discussions, let's bring somebody on board to assist with this process. Um, nobody on staff has experience with uh, revenue measure or going through this process. And so um, staff obtained a proposal from Smart Marketing. Um, as part of this review, it's clear that the city's revenues are not projected to be sufficient to maintain fiscal sustainability, address public safety's priorities, and then also address the roads. If you go back to uh, 2019, um, early in that year, we did a transportation workshop in which it was, uh, you know, we evaluated the roadways. And at that point in time, the cost to maintain the roads in their current condition was about $7.3 million annually. To increase the condition to what would be considered the low end of good, it was about $8 million annually. If you fast forward to 2023, that price has gone up significantly. To maintain the current condition, which has declined since 2019, it's about $13 million price tag on an annual basis. And that's not just for a couple of years, that's ongoing for many years. And if you want to increase it to the state average a payment condition index of 65, which is still just fair, it's not good. That's about a $20 million price tag. Um, when you add that to the uh, public safety priorities, you know, there's, there's a lot associated with that. And so um, as the revenue ad hoc, we talked about their opportunities to increase revenues, one of which is a uh, potential revenue measure for within the city limits for the November 2024 election. Um, the revenue ad hoc, as I've mentioned before, uh, this council is very data-driven, very methodical, wants to know what the process is going to be, how are we gonna get there? And so they recommended approaching it with that methodical manner. And like I said, getting somebody on board to assist us with that process. So staff obtained a proposal from Smart Marketing and Public Affairs of Yuba City to provide revenue measure consulting services for November 2024 revenue measure. And it's broken into four phases. So phase one is assessment strategy and message development. Phase two is communicating the need. Phase three is building understanding. And phase four is qualifying the ballot measure. And when I, I talk about these phases, you know, the city can't advocate for a measure. The city can only um, do an education process as to why additional revenues are necessary. So we're approaching it from that standpoint. And as noted, the time frame goes from March of 2023 through August of 2024. Why August of 2024? Because that would be the deadline to put a measure on the November 2024 ballot. So the term of agreement as noted is 18 months. It commences upon execution of the agreement and shall continue until the scope of work is complete or until the city opts not to pursue a November 2024 revenue measure or until either party suspends the performance of the services or terminates the agreement by giving 15 days prior written notice. So with that, um, there have been quite a few questions that have come up from a variety of sources. It's come from staff, it's come from um, the Appeal Democrat, it's come from the public in terms of, you know, why is the city doing what we're doing? Um, did we issue an RFP? If we didn't, why didn't we issue an RFP? Is there a conflict between council and smart marketing as uh, smart marketing ran the campaign of four of the current council members? And so I wanna address these questions. The other thing is as I'm going through this, I fully um, invite council to interject on any of these responses. Feel free to interrupt me and um, I'll go through this. So why didn't staff follow? So first of all, staff did not follow a bidding process in this. Um, but we have fully complied with all of the city's procedures and all legal requirements. And so why didn't staff follow bidding uh, process for these services? And so per the municipal code, section 2-6.14, which is exemptions from competitive bidding, it states that competitive bidding requirements for purchase and sales over the limits set forth in section 2-6.08 may be waived when the council determines that it is in the best interest of the city to do so. The conditions authorizing waiver of the competitive bidding requirements may include, and it notes, professional services, of which this is a professional services contract. The other thing is that, um, you know, many candidates and the other local agencies within the Yuba Center area have utilized local professionals for uh, elected related and marketing activities, including smart marketing and public affairs, who's, who's well known in this area. 
With Smart Marketing and Public Affairs, um, they guided Yuba County through Yuba County's Measure K process, which was a revenue measure. It was a contested revenue measure and it prevailed. And so they have experience with um, this specific type of project. The other thing is that they're familiar with a local community. Um, one of the things that we evaluate is, as we are looking at doing an RFP is what are going to be the evaluation factors? What are you going to score proposals based upon? With this type of, of work, one of the things that we would base it upon is the knowledge of the local community. What is the knowledge of the local political climate, the local community, and the proposals would be scored heavily based upon that factor. Um, Smart Marketing is familiar with the local community. They have experience helping a local agency with their revenue measure, and they were successful with that revenue measure. So, any any council input on that item? Sure, I would be. I'd happy to, as part of the ad hoc committee. You know, this this question about, um, and I'll just call it sole sourcing. It, it was one that we definitely um, spent some time considering, because it 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 would uh, we knew that it would pr propose or bring up an issue in regards to why would we do this? I think Diana did a very good job of articulating what um, the ad hoc committee comprised of Councilman or Vice Mayor Harris and myself considered. Um, we had a lot of data from a 2018 study already that we had um, commissioned with the Lou Edwards group. We had a lot of data that the county had shared with us when we were um, talking with them and we had a fair amount of data from recent activity going door to door um, in regards to, okay, what are the issues out there? So the, the real concern is, okay, how do we engage the public? Um, and I believe that you know, our effort here, and one of the reasons why we were not um, a participant in the last measure was that we felt like we owed it to the citizens of Yuba City to be as transparent and open as possible uh, as Diana mentioned, you know, cities aren't marketing agencies. Cities aren't agencies that, you know, have a, a, a true mission of, of getting out and, and how do you effectively do that. So we seek professional help when we need that. And smart marketing with the history provides that level of professional help. There'll be more I'll be talking about as we go down through these bullets, but I just wanted to add that to the conversation. Thank you. Great. Um, is there a conflict of interest between council members and smart marketing? I'm gonna direct this question to the city attorney. Thank you very much. And as you can tell from the last item, we take disclosures and recusals very, very seriously. And we do here. And there's two items that would be primarily involved. One is what's called the, uh, the uh, Political Reform Act or the PRA. And the other one is what we call government code 1090 conflicts. And the state legislature has basically said hey, if you're a decision maker, you shouldn't be making money off the deal. You shouldn't be having a financial interest in the deal. That's not in the public interest. But there is a difference between are the decision makers having a financial interest in something and what I call the subway rule. And that is just because you've eaten at Subway in the past and done business there doesn't mean that you own a Subway or work at a Subway. There's your difference. If any one of these board members owned or worked at a subway, they would have a financial interest. Merely because you go there and buy a sandwich does not disqualify you. And so there has been some questions as, well, is this a legal conflict of interest because some council members have used the service of this business in the past? And the answer is no, no legal conflict of interest. Thank you. Thank you. I would add that again, um, in a previous campaign, uh, I used a company called Sapphire Marketing. In my last campaign, I used a company called um, Smart Marketing. I paid for those services. I didn't, I had to pay for those services. I'm not receiving any financial benefit um, by selecting Smart Marketing um, for, for this particular project. Um, that's, I mean, I, I need to make that abundantly clear. The other thing that continues to be alleged out in the unknown anonymous people in the community is that um, there is somehow some connection to smart marketing and the decisions I make at this dais. I do not have an ongoing relationship with smart marketing. Uh, I don't have her 
or her husband or any other participant in that company on retainer. So the false narrative out there needs to stop, at least on my part. Here. Um, I have no financial interest in smart marketing. Smart marketing supply to service to me, just as our attorney said, I go to a gas station every day and buy gas. I use the service. Uh, I have received uh, no input from these people other than trying to get elected and using what their knowledge was to be get elected. Um, and uh, the uh, false narrative, as uh, Councilman just said, needs to stop. Uh, there, is, there is nothing. I'm, I'm very transparent. Uh, I, I, I didn't get on this council to line my pockets whatsoever from anybody. I owe no one a thing other than the contributors they gave me, and I can't. I would recuse myself the minute they came up and started to try to do business with the city, and that's my responsibility. So you you can be assured that uh, I don't. If you d you don't know me, if you think somebody's uh, uh, guiding me to make decisions, it doesn't work that way with this gentleman right here. So uh, just so that you know that uh, no financial interest in whatsoever in smart marketing. So thank you. Well said, uh, Council Member, and and I'll and I'll I'll just add to what, what's already been said. Um, uh, for those of you that remember way back in 2016, um, I ran, and um, I no no representation. Um, I just kind of threw it at the wall and, and did the best I could, and uh, I got close, but I lost. And I figured, well, that's that. And uh, you know, 2018 rolled around, and I I, I opted not to because there was nine people that ran that year. And, uh, but in 2020, uh, when it came back around again, I said, you know what, maybe, maybe this time I'll, I'll take it a little bit more seriously. And I asked around town and I said, well, you know, who's, who's the, who's the, uh, the company to talk to. And that was, it, it turned out to be, uh, it turned out to be uh, smart marketing. And so, um, th there's been, um, concerns, uh, even, even after I came on council of, of, uh, uh from from council people that were who I'm sitting next to, that there there might be some uh, members in the community that had uh, some kind of uh, influence on my decisions. No, my 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 decisions are my decisions, and and that's where that's where it starts, and and that's, that's where it ends. I would like to point out also that um, this council did um, uh, entertain briefly. Uh, the before we started talking about uh, a revenue measure, we we we, we entertained briefly the idea of uh, cannabis. Uh, it seems to work across the river, and uh, so we held a, a purely informational meeting in this this room, and the whole world showed up for it, and they they said overwhelmingly no. So um, this council heard that loud and clear, and so um, I feel like we have uh, ex exhausted. Um, at least most of our, our options, and, and we, which has brought us to where we are today. So thank you. All right. Um, what percentage of a sales tax is council considering? As I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, we're at the very, very early stages of this discussion. And so um, there hasn't been any type of decision as to the percentage. Now we have talked about what a 1% would equate to if it was within the city limits, that's approximately $14.5 million, but there hasn't been a discussion of this is what we would move forward with. Any comments on that? Just uh, echo that. Um, I think that's to be determined. And I think that as we move through this process and be transparent and hold community meetings and share information, I think then we will be in a better spot to understand exactly what we would propose. And again, at the end of the day, the voter gets to decide whether they tax themselves or not. It's not that we get to impose a tax. The, the things that we're, we're going to be discussing are going to be those things that we feel the public needs to know in anticipation and in, in, of, a, of not only a, a measure, but whether they vote yes or no on it. Not being part of that ad hoc committee, I have not discussed it with anyone or had any opinions at this point. Uh, because I'm not part of that ad hoc committee, which would make a quorum at that point. So I, 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 I'm, I'm open. Let me put it to you that way. All right. 
Will it be a general sales tax or a special sales tax? And what distinguishes that is the percentage approval for a general sales tax. It's the 50% plus one for a special sales tax. It's a two thirds majority. Um, again, we're at the very early stages. Um, there is a need specific to public safety and roads, which could lend itself to a special sales tax. But again, the revenue ad hoc would like input from the citizen advisory group and the citizens. One council person speaking, totally um, in support of special taxes earmarked for specific, specific things that we would be able to quantify and present to the voter. Um, I'm leery of general sales tax, but again, as Diana mentioned, we are at the beginning of this. If, if the community felt like they wanted to go for a general sales tax, then that's what we'll listen to and we'll go forward with. But I, as one, have said this from the time that I ran the first time. I'm a, if you're gonna put a tax on me, I wanna know where the money's going and I wanna know that it's gonna stay here for that purpose. Mayor, um, I would echo that as well. I'm not for, unless the citizens, I mean, this is gonna be citizen driven. Your, your boat's gonna make this happen or not. We can only drive the, drive the boat, but you're gonna put the gas in it. Uh, so uh, I'm more of a special tax. General tax, this, this council could change in four years. And you go to general and, wow, no, we're going to go off on this new shiny object. So I, I'm, I'm all for a special tax as well. So um, during this last election, um, obviously, um, you know, people were talking about Measure A. And... Um, I'll, I'll be honest. I, I mean, I voted for it. I saw I saw value in it. Um, I'm a citizen of Yuba City and Sutter County. I saw value in it. But in public or, or in social events, when 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 um, when the subject came up, it, it seemed it seemed to me that if if there was a, an objection, there was one objection, and it was that it was a, it was a general. It was a general tax, and there was this, it was unclear of, of where it was going to go. So, um, yeah, I, I would I would be I would be for something a little bit more uh, specific. For example, um, um, uh, first responders, uh, public safety, and roads. Um, that, that'd be my, my my support. All right. So why is the city seeking a revenue measure now when it didn't participate in Sutter County's Measure A? So I think this is a, a good question. And one of the things that I appreciate, um, last October, you know, Robert Suma with the Appeal Democrat reached out to me and it was related to an article about Sutter County's attempt to include Yuba City in Measure A. And he allowed me the opportunity to address um, the process, that the how the city had been involved. And I noted in that interview that you know, the, the city has the need for the money. It's not that the, the need's not there. Um, it was a matter of the city didn't have the chance to lay the groundwork as to why the money was needed. And so from a public perception standpoint, if we were to join in, the public would say, why is Yuba City joining in? What are they going to use it for? And, and we hadn't had the opportunity um, to, to be able to explain to the public and walk the public through the process of this is why it wasn't a matter of, uh, you know, lack of need, um, and also the uncertainties of, um, you know, what was happening with inflation and, and the the economic times. But you know, the reason the city didn't openly participate in Measure A at that time was just a matter of the city hadn't had the chance to explain why it was necessary or would be necessary for the city. Anybody want to add to that? Pretty much ditto. Um, as a member of the group that was meeting with the county, um, we were having discussions, and I imagine that we will continue to have discussions on a, a tax sharing uh, agreement. Um, I'm not closing the door on anything. I don't think they've closed the door on anything. And like I mentioned at the forum, you know, we, we have a discussion uh, with them consistently about service delivery. I think Diana hit the nail on the head. The reason, I, I know one of the reasons I was reluctant to move forward is we had not had an opportunity to have the, the, the uh, discussions with our citizens, the folks that were gonna be affected by the tax. Um, 
and and their compressed time frame was one that wasn't going to allow us a lot of time to do that. And, and frankly, theirs is a general tax, and I think you just heard how I feel about a general tax. Again, I'm not slamming the door on anything over there. And in fact, we've ha we've had some informal discussions in regards to okay, what's going on, and I expect that those may continue. I don't know why they wouldn't. Well, I wasn't elected at the period that this was all going on. I did have an opportunity to speak on it at the forum that the uh, uh, chamber had at the time. And my consensus was one, I wasn't for a general tax. The economic downturn and situations were going on in, in our state and our nation. And uh, I basically said most agenda items go down in flames when they're half-baked. And this, I quote unquote, this was a half-baked idea from the county. And I want to work with the county. I live in this county, and uh, I know their needs as well. well. I don't know all their needs, but I know they have needs. And uh, so, no, I, I, I'm not shutting the door on anyone. I, I would never do that to the rest of the citizens. I did mention, though, that it seemed a little lopsided that 70% of the population in commerce comes from the city and only maybe 30 or so comes from the county. And I thought the 50-50 split was a little lopsided uh, at the time. So, but I am always open for conversations with, with our county uh, representation. So uh, you can always count on that from me. Yes, so uh, one, of the, one of the committees that the, that the mayor and the, va the vice mayor uh, and the chair and the vice chair sit on and meet monthly is the intergovernmental committee. And um, this is a monthly meeting where um, we talk about stuff like this. And so it's, it's, not, like, it's not like one against the other. Uh, they're, they're, I feel like there's, there's, there's communication, as, as uh, Vice Mayor, excuse me, uh, Council Member Boomgarden said. Uh, we're not going to close the door on anybody. Um, we, we see the need. I, I attended um, two of the forums, excuse me, two of the town halls that uh, at the time Vice Chair um, Karen Baines uh, had in, in his district, and um, and I listened uh, uh, for I listened to the, the county's needs. I understood the county's needs. Uh, unfortunately, um, those, in, through no fault of the county, those, those, those meetings really weren't really well attended. But, um, yeah, I mean, the, the, need is, the need is there, and it's, and it's being heard. Through the mayor, if I might. Um, one of the things that uh, Ms. Langley mentioned was a budget ad hoc committee. And a budget ad hoc committee was implemented, as she mentioned, in 2019. Over the time, it's, it's evolved into... A, a pretty uh, in-depth, and I would say really in-depth, the past year, line-by-line -line look at each department's operating expenditures and utilizing historical data, what they've been given and what they have spent. And one of the reasons we started this in 2019 was we wanted to, to make sure that as a council at that time, and it's carried forward through this council, is that our city departments are operating with budgets that are actual and factual. That process leads me to a level of comfort with that budget because I worked with it myself as a fire chief for 14 years. I know how it works. I know where you can put stuff and everything else. That budget is what it needs to be and what it, well, I don't want to say what it needs to be. It is as tight as you can make it right now. And that exercise needed to be done for me to stand in front of anybody and say, we need more revenue. That gives me a level of comfort. I believe it gives the council a level of comfort. Um, and I, I think that that's an important point to make in this, in this ever, effort. What we're going to come up to, with with the county is simply this. We have a lot of needs. If you drive on our roads right now, and we were we were benefited by three years of drought, if that makes any sense. Our roads didn't get trashed by the water intrusion. Take a look around town right now. It, it, it's horrible. And, and I think Diana's going to talk a little bit about what those road numbers are, or I can right now. Our road number, just to get maintenance, is $13 million. 
what did she say a 1% sales tax brings in? $14.5 million, okay? That's not even beginning to address things in public safety, such as homelessness, police, and fire protection. So you can see the difficulty that's going to exist when we, we sit with our partners, who also represent the city, by the way, as county supervisors, and say, look, how are we going to carve this up? They have a need. I don't doubt that they have a need. I know we have a need. So what are we going to do? And, th and that's in when we start talking about you know, participating together with each other, we're going to have to figure that out. We're going to have to figure that out. All right, so the next question, if the revenue measure is successful, will the city share revenues with Sutter County? I think that the council members have addressed that question. And then importantly, why isn't the city discussing reducing services or staff to reduce costs? And so I think it's important to note, so of a $52.5 million general fund budget, police makes up $20 million and fire makes up $13 million of that budget. So between police and fire, they're close to two thirds of the general fund budget. And so, um, any significant reduction in expenditures would impact public safety. And if you try to keep public safety whole, then what you're really looking at is your next two largest budgets are community services, which is parks and recreation, and then also public works, which portion of public works is funded through streets and roads that comes through the general fund. And so there's, there's not, as council member Boomgarden noted, as participating on the budget ad hoc, there's not a lot of places to look for the type of funding that's required to address the roads. All right, any, any additional comments on that? A comment through the mayor, a comment was made um, by Nate Black um, from the county uh, at a recent leadership training that uh, the chamber put on. And his comment was, maybe we should be going after the state to recover the money that was supposed to be given to the cities through gas tax and road tax. I don't disagree with that, but what's the likelihood of us being able to get that money in this current environment? I, I, think, it's, I think it's not, I don't believe it to be very possible. So at the end of the day, what are we gonna do? Um, and this is why we have a revenue ad hoc committee. This is why we're gonna be going out to the public and that we're not ringing the bell and, and, and saying, oh, look, you know, tomorrow we're going to do this, we're going to do that. We're out ahead. We're out ahead and we're being transparent. We're out ahead being transparent and we're going to seek input. And that's the purpose of where we're at today. And, um, yeah, that's good. You know, I, I'd just like to add on. I'm sorry. I jumped that. Uh, I, I'd just like to add on to what that. Um, you know, I've, I've lived in this community my whole life, and, and it seems like, um, I can remember as a kid, it's almost like we're hardwired to go shop other places, Sacramento, um, Roseville, Rockland didn't even exist back then. But if you do that now, and you get that receipt for that, whatever, you buy goods and services, you look at the very bottom of that receipt, and it says 8.5%, 9%, maybe even more. And so these are, these, these are opportunities that, that unfortunately are, are, are leaving our area, and it's money, it's going elsewhere, that um, could be going to reinforce our roads, uh, to make, our, uh, make us a safer community. It's just an opportunity that's being missed. You look at the last election cycle, uh, Chico is, a, is an example. They passed a 1%, uh, it works out to be 24 to 25 million a year, no sunset. Calusa, uh, they had a measure A as well. And, and then the list goes on and on. This is all public information you can find online. But um, it's just, it's, 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 no, uh, oh, I think I've said enough. Go ahead. Diane, you gave me some numbers uh, about the cities our size and how many are not participating in moving up their sales tax. You right. So Yuba City is one of seven cities in the state of California with a population of over 50,000 that does not have a revenue measure. One of seven. Those, the other cities are Thousand Oaks, Simi Valley, Redding, Camarillo, Rockland, and Hanford. And just because some of these cities don't have a revenue measure in place doesn't mean they don't have other revenue generating items in place such as a utility user's tax or um, you know something similar to that. And so one of seven cities in California with a population of greater than 50,000 that does not have 
a revenue measure in place. Thank you. All right. So moving on to the fiscal impact. So the total consulting fee is a not to exceed $135,000, and that's based on a base consulting fee of $7,500 a month for the full 18 months. So that's from March of 2023 through November or through August of 2024. In addition, includes a budget of $40,000 for hard costs. So that's um, print materials. Um, you know, advertising, that type of thing. So for a total budget not to exceed of $175,000, there's $100,000 in the city manager's budget for professional services. I'm requesting a supplemental appropriation of $75,000 from one-time Federal American Rescue Plan Act funds, of which we have approximately $6 million remaining. And the question was, you know, why aren't you planning to use the $6 million to, um, to assist with the revenues and, and the the responses we are, you know, as we move forward, if if a November 2024 revenue measure were, were successful, the city would not see a full year of revenue for that until fiscal year 25, 26. And so we're talking two years, over two years from now, that we would start to generate uh, revenue from that measure. So alternatives are to uh, direct staff to issue a request for proposals for these services and obtain proposals from other consultants. Do not proceed with pursuing a potential uh, November 2024 <coughs> revenue measure and dissolve the revenue ad hoc committee. Provide direction to the revenue ad hoc committee to explore other opportunities to generate revenues. There are other opportunities. There's parcel tax. As, as the mayor said, there's cannabis sales. We, we did get responses from the public about that. Uh, there's utility users tax. The thing with all of those um, other options is they still require the vote of the, either the property owner or the public. So you're still in the same process or direct staff to reduce the scope of services. And so the recommendation is written here. Uh, basically, it's to adopt a resolution to award a contract for revenue measure consulting services to smart marketing and public affairs for the 175,000 and then also approve a supplemental appropriation of $75,000 from ARPA money. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any additional questions. Okay, we do have uh, some comments, um, read co uh, comments from the public on this item. Uh, the first one is from Cash Gill. Cashkill, uh, 1737 Vintage Court, Yuba City. Um, I don't even know where to begin. Uh, first of all, thank you for taking my calls and uh, hearing my concerns on this uh, matter. I've uh, been on the council for eight years, was mayor of the city of Yuba City twice. This is the first time that I've seen where the council members making their own decisions uh, without doing an RFP. Uh, I know our attorney explained uh, conflict of interest but it could also be, you know, uh, quid pro quo. Uh, depends on how you want to define it. Uh, in my opinion, you guys are not transparent. You're awarding this without an RFP. Uh, the two ad hoc committees got together. I visited with several of you on several occasions, and you said the city's doing really well. We got plenty of reserves. Now, all of a sudden, after the election, you have a meeting, and after the meeting, now all of a sudden we find out the city's uh, shortfall in potholes and going to need $12 million. My recommendation, taking a look at this, you guys should table this. You should put this out for an RFP, regardless of who gets it. You should bring the county of Sutter to the table right now. You should bring the city of Live Oak to, uh, to the table right now. It's, it's one community that's taking a look at it, not one stepchild versus the other stepchild looking at it. You guys talk about data. Let me just give you some real data as a banker and as a farmer, let me tell you guys, and I don't know if you know this, this is the worst time for the farming community. Walnut prices are all time low. Almond prices are an all time low. And so you're gonna go to a lot of the farming community that buys the tractors, <laughs> buys the chemicals, buys the trucks in this community to come out and support this tax. I'm definitely not gonna support it the way it's presented right now, and I'll make sure all my friends aren't supporting it because you guys aren't being transparent. We as a community, we're already paying two levy taxes right now. We're paying two Yuba College taxes right now. And we have a Yuba City unified sales tax for the stuff that we've done. 
how much more are you guys going to keep taxing without being transparent coming through this? Instead of trying to unite the community, I honestly feel that you guys are dividing this community. And I think one of you made a comment that it's 70% to the city and 30% to the county. That's fine. But bring them to the table. When the county started this earlier, I know all of you guys were saying, well, they didn't ask us. They didn't ask us. And at that point in time, it was a 50-50 split. As soon as it got done, now it's like who can go to the trough first and try to get the most amount of money. If you want to have this tax passed, if you want to have this community united, I urge you guys to table this, put that at the RFP, bring in community members, community advisory committee, and bring the county and the city of Live Oak on board to do that. That's what I ask. Thank you. Thank you. Our, uh, our next speaker card. Our next speaker card is from John Buckland. Thank you for the opportunity to come and speak. Uh, I'm so sorry. John Buckland. I'm so sorry, Mr. Buckland. Is it is the speaker on? I want to make sure everyone can hear you. I believe it's dead. Could, could we wait a moment? I want to make sure everybody can hear <laughs> uh, I, and I'm sorry, Mr. Buckland. I just want to make sure everyone can hear you. That's fine. Thank you. There you go, sir. Thank you. I now have a green light, apparently. Um, again, thank you, Mayor. Uh, John Buckland, 1478 LaGrand Avenue. Also a business um, owner and also a distributor, um, international distributor of a product. I can tell you that straight up, um, if we're looking at a, at a sales tax uh, measure, this needs to go out to an RFP. Nothing against uh, Crystal or Smart Marketing or anything else or against um, any of the uh, current council members um, having done business with her, that's not the issue. The issue is uh, transparency, and fairness, um, especially for our public. These are public dollars that we're gonna spend. We just saw a whole bunch of, um, can't even talk about it, but what item number 11, the, the millions of dollars uh, that wanna go forward on a, on a pet project. We don't need that. We need our roads fixed. Um, S, I mean, Mr. Boomgarden brought it forward, uh, SB1. How do you get there? Well, self-help. Uh, self-help tax is how you get matching funds under SB1. So if you want to get the state of, uh, of California that passed in, in 2017 SB1, and you want a piece of those billions of dollars that they have available, you can get it. But you have to do it the right way, and you have to be funded uh, through a tax measure to be able to get there. And it has to be a specific tax measure. It cannot be a general tax measure. It has to be for uh, self-help. So I encourage you to look at a lot of things. I would toss this thing tonight and start all over again. I do agree with uh, Mayor Gill uh, that, that it really needs to be looked at from Sutter County, Yuba City, and Live Oak as a collective uh, group. Uh, it, it affects all of us. And in my businesses, uh, when I sell in California, I have to collect the tax. Uh, there's some other states. There's 16 other states that I'm selling to right now that I have to collect a tax on uh, to be able to put out a product. Uh, when I go on international shipping, I'm paying a tax. This digs in. Every tax that you talk about digs into our pockets as a private Small business owner, it hurts. Every penny hurts. And when I have to collect that and retain it and report it, you think that just I'm just passing it along? No, it takes staff work. We have to do accounting. We have to do um, our due diligence to make sure that we're paying the state of California and those other 16 state jurisdictions that we sell into um, and different countries being Canada, Mexico, um, Panama, all the way down into South America, um, I have a, a very large swath of distributorship. So I thank you. I, I really encourage you to look at this, go out to an RFP, uh, do the right thing, 
and, and let's get this out um, and, and open this thing up transparently for everybody so we know what we're doing. Um, and then let's include um, all, of, all of our community together. I thank you for your time and thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you. Uh, we have a speaker card from Jim Whitaker. All right, I guess we got the green light, so I'm on, right? I am Jim Whitaker, I live in Sutter County. So, Honorable Mayor Kirshner and Honorable City Council members, I first want to start off with uh, giving you guys kudos because, you know, obviously a lot of people don't know you have a tough job. And, uh, and your leadership uh, throughout the years and trying to make uh, Yuba City a quality place to live, I th think is uh, remarkable. So I, I wanted to start out with that. Second thing I would want to say that regardless of the fact that of what I believe, I am still going to be a supportive of your 1% sales tax, all right? And I just want you, each one, every one of you to know that. Um, I've worked with Smart Marketing, Crystal Martin. I've worked with uh, Sapphire Marketing, uh, Carrie Houck. Both businesses are reputable businesses, uh, remarkable businesswomen as well in this community. Um, my biggest thing is I look at the optics of this whole thing. And so in perception being reality, um, and reading the, the article today in the newspaper and hearing uh, public comments, it just doesn't look good. It's not, it's not a good way to start out. You know, if you're, if you're looking for a 1% sales tax, it's just not a good way to, to you know, to kick this thing off. Uh, I would personally like to see all of you support going out to an RFP. I know, I listened to Ms. Langley, that it's not, uh, you know, it's within your policy. You don't have to go out for an RFP. Uh, as a supervisor, I've always asked department heads, and I'm sure you've asked department heads that, that, to go out for an RFP uh, on, on a lot of their projects. And so uh, this, what it does, it just keeps an equal playing field for all businesses. Um, this sets a bad uh, uh, precedence. You know, by, if you're granting smart marketing this contract, what it says to other businesses is that they're, they're going to want the same thing. You know? And how do you justify that? After you give this to smart marketing, people are going to say, "Wait, I want, I want, I want to be exempt, you know, from your RFP as well." So currently, you know as well as I do that in this country, there's just a big mistrust of government, and and this goes along with it. Um, you you want to be transparent. You want to be responsible with the taxpayers' money. I believe by utilizing an RFP, that that would suffice everybody's belief that hey, it was done fairly. Um, Currently, you're looking at a contract from March of uh, 2023 to August of 2024. Well, after that contract's done, what happens to September of 2024 and October of 2024 when those absentees haven't even gone out yet and your consultants is already done? So something for you to consider, to look at. I fully agree with uh, the, the, uh, the past two mayors that, and you know, that we should be looking at, uh, and I know you're in preliminary stages right now, but you should be looking at Partnering with uh, Sutter County as well as the City of Live Oak, and but I think uh, you know I have confidence in each and every one of you that you'll do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker card is from uh, Richard Clay. Uh, Rich, excuse me, Richard Cray. Uh, yes, my name is uh, Richard Cray, 2160 Live Oak Boulevard, here in Yuba City. And I want to agree with the gentlemen that have preceded me. They've all spoken eloquently about your lack of trans, uh, transparency. And even though each of you has uh, elucidated reasons why you don't think that this might appear to be a conflict of interest, trust me, it appears that way. That's the lack of transparency, I believe, that was uh, spoken of. Now, I agree that uh, you might want to get together with Sutter County and the city of Live Oak to do this measure in one large uh, uh, effort, because I think that you'll find that, that you might be successful that way. And I want to congratulate you on recognizing the need for this. Because so many people during the uh, lead up to uh, the vote on Measure A opposed it without really thinking about 
where are we going to get the funds that we need to operate the city, to operate the county? So thank you for having the foresight to recognize the need for this. I just urge you to table this tonight and seek an RFP and work with the county and the city of Live Oak as well. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And we have a speaker card from Sharon Foot. Foot. Sharon Foot. Hello, my name is Sharon Foot. I reside at 1461 Thomas Drive in Yuba City. Um, a couple of comments I'd like to make. Um, I haven't been a city council member. I've not been a board of supervisor member, but I am a resident of Yuba City in Sutter County, and I enjoy my county and I enjoy my city. And I can understand where you might feel that we need more monies, and I don't disagree that we need monies in our city and our county. Um, Going back, though, you just gave away a parcel of land that a farm owner is going to make a development and make money. And I think that's unfortunate that you decided you'd give him that parcel and let him do what he wants to do with it. Um, on this particular measure, uh, I think you need to um, advertise the bidding process for this particular um, evaluation of our city. And um, it's not a lot of money, but still at that, it's a matter of transparency and letting the people of Yuba City and Sutter County know that you are um, looking out for their interests. Um, you can tell me all the things you want to tell me about, oh, it's not a conflict of interest, even though I use that particular um, business for my campaigns. Um, okay, maybe so. But we have other entities in our community and the surrounding area that could provide the same services and should have an opportunity to uh, use um, the bidding process. Uh, the last item is, I measure A I felt was um, well done. Um, I don't understand why the city of Yuba City and Sutter County could not go together. Uh, you comment about how well you work together in our government and yet you couldn't get together and come up with measure A and B or whatever you want to call it um, to serve our community and our county. Um, and so I would hope that Sutter County would be interested in talking to us as a city and the city of Live Oak to put this together as one package. I think it's very important I'm not sure it'll pass one way or the other, uh, but I think you need to be transparent with our community and really tell them what's going on. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Any uh, further public comment on this item? Any further public comment? Okay, seeing none, I'll bring it back to council for comments. Jim stated it, Mr. Whitaker, perception is reality. Uh, whether or not we are legally in our grounds of what we're doing, it's perceived as being wrong. And I get that totally. And this is so important to our community, getting off to a bad start of not having it, what you perceive as not being transparent, concerns me greatly. Uh, it... Uh, uh, there is no conflicts, and I, I will state it again and again and again. However, I'm a citizen. I'm a business owner, too. 
pays those taxes. I figured it out the other day. I have to work 86 hours a day or 86 hours a month at fifteen fifty an hour to pay my property tax. I'm a property owner just like all of the rest of you. I don't like paying those taxes, but it's a need. The state of California, you have to realize we're in a rural community. We get table scraps. Who runs this state? Los Angeles and San Francisco. Whatever goes there is what we get left over. Um, but I am very, very, very concerned about getting off to a good start with this because it is so important to this community. Uh, I, my road is 50, 53 years old in front of my house. <laughs> it's not there any longer. I want it to be there. So uh, I get what you're saying about the transparency. There's not any lack of transparency, but there's a perception of that, and that bothers me immensely. So um, that, that's, that's my comments, gentlemen. Thank you for that, uh, Council Member uh, Pasquale. Um, no, I, I, you know, I, I have had conversations with some of the folks who, who spoke here tonight and, and certainly hear their concerns. And I, I, I never discredit them because those who did reach out to me, I, I value their opinions and, and respect them as well. Um, you know, it, as a leadership isn't always tidy. And sometimes as an elected official, we are elected to represent and make decisions. And we certainly don't take that lightly. I know I don't. Um, but there comes times when you have to sit back and go, okay, what have I heard? And what, you know, which, where's, where am I wanting to go for the city that uh, I have, have spent a lot of time in? And with that, um, you know, it, 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 to me, I think, as Diana mentioned, we're at the beginning of this. So to suggest that we're not going to in, engage the citizens or we're not going to do this, um, that's not true. There is not an, no conflict of interest. We have a, uh, a provider in smart marketing who I have uh, a high level of confidence because of the past track record that I'm not aware, at this time anyway, of anyone else locally who has to do that. There are firms and um, our friends at the county engaged with those firms. To, to handle their measure. I choose to keep my money local. I was a business owner, I was a business operator, and I take to heart the fact that my, my family and I live here and will be affected by a potential tax. I know what I feel the need is, and for that, I would support the resolution that staff has presented. Okay, thank you. Um, so this, this is, uh, this is, this is one of those tough ones. Um, as Council Member Pasquale said, sometimes it's all about perception, and it's definitely uh, in this case. Um, things that I, I, I took under consideration, which we said before, is um, keeping it local. Um, our counterparts, um, in their measure, chose to go elsewhere. I, I'd like to keep our, 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 money, uh, our money local. Um, I do like the fact that uh, in the wording of this agreement, there's an escape clause for both parties. And I do appreciate that from, from, from staff. Um, and lastly, the, the, the RFP question, and I've, I've been getting that a lot. And what I did was I thought about um, if that came up, if that question came up with the county when they when they passed, when they, when they, when they attempted to pass measure A. And so, um, th that was my, th these, I these items were part of my thought process. So if the council doesn't have any more questions on this or comments, um, I'm ready to accept action on this. Through the mayor. Yes. Move to approve staff's recommendation, adopt a resolution awarding a professional service agreement to Smart Marketing Public Affairs UBC California for Revenue Measure Consulting Services in an amount not to exceed 135,000 for base consulting fees plus 40,000 for other hard project costs 
for a total not to exceed $170,000 subject to immaterial modifications by the city manager upon approval of the city attorney as a legal form with the finding that is in the best interest of the city and approve a supplemental appropriation of $75,000 from one-time Federal American Rescue Plan Act funds to account number 1305-62701 city manager budget professional services. Uh, Mr. Bo or Council Member Boomgarden, that was $175,000, is that correct? I, yes. Thank you. Thank you. I've got a motion from Councilmember Boomgarden. Do I have a second? Do I have a second? Th through the mayor? Yes. Just so you know, in order for this item to pass tonight, there must be three affirmative votes. If there are not three affirmative votes, the motion does not pass. So if I note that there are not council members here, mm -hmm. Um, one of the options may be to continue the matter if there are not three affirmative votes. So, um, since I can't second it myself. You can second yourself. I don't have a third. What was that? We need three. But you need three votes. So if yes. you were to second it and it was a two to one, it just wouldn't pass is what it wouldn't have. So the option is to, uh, to shelve it for another meeting? You could continue the item to the next meeting. Or you could second the item and then have a formal vote, and then if the resolution didn't pass, then then you could decide at that point whether or not to continue it. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm going to motion for this to be continued to the next city council meeting? Yes, you can make that motion. Yes. There, there needs to be a second, however. Um, so I'm going to make a motion that we, we shelve this for the next city council meeting. Do I have a second? I have to rescind my motion, correct? Uh, no, you can have uh, up to three motions on the floor at any one time. Do I have a second? Yeah, I'll second it. Okay. So that's going to get moved to the next city council meeting, correct? City uh, city. There has to be a vote of three council members to support that motion. Okay, so I'm going to make I'm going to I'm going to make a motion to move this item to the next city council meeting. I've got uh, first and second. And uh, do a roll call on this, correct? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Okay, hey. just to be clear for the record, it was a 3 0 vote to continue to the next meeting. Correct. Already, thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving right along. Future agenda of items. Future agenda of items. This is an opportunity to discuss with the city manager about items that came up late in a meeting this evening that you would like to have brought back to council at later date. Do we have any comments from the public? Okay. Reports and communication. The following reports and communication items are provided by council for the, for the council's information. No action can be taken on items under this section unless the council agrees to include it on a subsequent agenda. Number 14, city manager's report. All right, thank you. Sorry for that delay. Um, so I just want to uh, note that Ashley Potochnik, who's our development liaison, had a You Can with Yuba City Shop Talk for professionals last Wednesday at the Dancing Tomato. And there were um, approximately about 15 uh, local businesses that participated. And some of the questions that you know came up is, does the city have a checklist if I want to start a new business? And uh, the answer is yes. And it talks about the different um, licenses and approvals that are required. She also talked about our new software program, Open Counter, that we'll be implementing. Um, Ashley and the mayor will be on 93Q tomorrow morning to again talk about You Can with Yuba City. Also next Tuesday at 6 p.m. here in the council chambers, we are going to have a community workshop on the proposed Merriment Village Apartments. It is a uh, proposed Habitat for Humanity affordable uh, housing project, 217 units, located on the vacant property on the east side of Walton Avenue. 
So I know there's been some uh, discussion, <coughs> confusion. Is this the property on the, the old Harrington property on the west side? No, it's not that property. That's a different project. This is the property on the east side. Uh, we welcome the public to come, see what the proposed plans are, provide some feedback. Um, Habitat will be submitting for funding applications under a couple of different programs, and that deadline's coming up in the uh, April-May timeframe, and so this item will be coming before council for consideration. Um, but it's a, a, you know, 217 units is a significant amount. And um, with that, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, um, city manager. Um, number 15, city council reports. We're gonna start off with council member Boomgarden. Thank you. I uh, attended uh, the Sabufka meeting, Sutter Buttes Flood Control Agency. Um, there is still uh, ongoing work um, in regards to a uh, um, projects that in, involve the, the levy uh, on the bypass. Um, not much to report at that meeting. Um, we did um, do a lot of, of changing. I think Matt Conant now is the supervisor, and excuse me, is the uh, chairperson. I uh, attended the Yuba City, uh, Yuba City Unified School District um, as the liaison to the to the city, and the, really the there was a lot of information shared. Nothing of super note, other than um, we are. I think everyone knows we're intending to have a council meeting at the high school and in, in um, to recognize the hundredth class graduating from Yuba City High School. As um, Ms. Langley just mentioned, we have a meeting next Tuesday. This is a, a potential project home key um, project at Merriment Village. This is on, on Walton Avenue. I hope um, people will come to and participate. I was not able to attend the Regional Housing Authority meeting due to illness. However, I do know that there was a property transfer that's going to continue to facilitate that senior housing down there adjacent to, to uh, Richland Housing. Attended the, the Chambers Gala um, where our local businesses uh, were recognized. Uh, it's a good event, and it's always good, I believe, to um, recognize businesses that are, are successful within our in our community. And just want to make a mention. It's always it's always um, amazing to me the amount of grant funding that um, the city is able to obtain. And for that, for the staff that's here or will listen, you know, appreciate that. That does help uh, tremendously when it comes to, to certain projects. So that's it. Thank you, sir. Moving along to Council Member Pasquale. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, attended in your stead to the Transit Authority meeting uh, and got the. Uh, uh, I had questions about Transit Authority back a meeting or so ago, and they basically hit it right on the nail. What I was asking about is they're re refiguring how they s deliver their services, which I found very, very enlightening um, in that. That was that was a good meeting. I also went to the chamber event. You know, there's 700 raucous people having a good time, and uh, it, it's amazing what we have to offer in this little community when you start talking to the business owners uh, and I had a good time. So that's all I have to report. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I, unfortunately I was, uh, I was out of town or I would have really enjoyed uh, going to that event. It's always a good event uh, and, and it seems, seems like everyone had a good time. Um, we mentioned earlier, uh, Sabufka, um, council member um, Boomgarden pretty much covered most of that. Um, the, uh, I, rel I relinquished the, the, the big chair to um, Supervisor uh, Matt Conant. I'm sure he'll do a great job. Uh, we went over financials. Uh, Gil Sizer, uh, we're going through the elected chair process. And um, not much, again, not much to, to, to talk about with that. Um, thank you, uh, Councilman, for, for, for covering me for, for, uh, from Yuba City Transit. Uh, it was announced, though, that um, they're going to ho host a virtual workshop, um, UBC Transit, with the possibility of offering passenger rail service north of Sacramento to Chico with possible stops in Marysville and Plumas Lake. So stay tuned for that. Uh, I was invited to go to a ribbon cutting um, for Estes Tree Service. Uh, good to see another business opening in town. Um, oh, I was in, uh, invited to speak 
to the Republican Central C uh, Committee to um, get them up to date on what is happening in our in our city. Um, attended my first uh, cap to cap uh, f the flood uh, cap to cap meeting uh, to discuss strategies or what we're going to discuss when we get to DC. Um, and today I uh, was at the um, police department uh, welcoming our uh, newly swearing in of a new a new uh, records clerk whose name is Nunes? Nunes? Samantha. Samantha. Yeah, I can't, I can't read my own handwriting. She thinking. Samantha Nunes. And it's exciting because you're keeping it in the family. Her, her brother is, is a sworn officer as well, so that's nice to see. And um, thank you. Uh, we had an interesting meeting tonight, but I'm always uh, impressed by our community's um, interest in participating in the process. And, and, and the decisions are not always easy ones. Um, so I do want to thank um, uh, our community for showing up and supporting this. Um, I would like to close um, the meeting tonight in remembrance of someone our community lost recently. Uh, Tom Pfeiffer uh, passed away on February 9th. If you don't know that name, uh, Tom uh, served two terms as a county supervisor, also served two terms on city council, Two terms, uh, two terms as mayor as well, and had quite a career. But mo mo more notably, he was in this seat um, May twenty first, nineteen seventy six, uh, during the bus crash. And so he he uh, he uh, he declared a uh, a week of, of of mourning for our community. I can't even imagine what that must have been. I was I was seven years old when that happened. I can't even imagine what that must have been like to have been in that seat when that happened. So this evening, uh, we're gonna close in his honor. Thank you. <laughs>